Section 7 of The Good Soldier, A Tale of Passion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Floyd Wilde. The Good Soldier, A Tale of Passion, by Ford Maddox Ford. Part 2, Section 1. The death of Mrs. Maiden occurred on the 4th of August, 1904, and then nothing happened until the 4th of August, 1913. There is the curious coincidence of dates, but I do not know whether that is one of those sinister, as if half-jocular and altogether merciless proceedings on the part of a cruel providence that we call a coincidence, because it may just as well have been the superstitious mind of Florence that forced her to certain acts, as if she had been hypnotized, it is, however, certain that the 4th of August always proved a significant date for her. To begin with, she was born on the 4th of August. Then on that date, in the year 1899, she set out with her uncle for the tour around the world in company with a young man called Jimmy. But that was not merely a coincidence. Her kindly old uncle, with the supposedly damaged heart, was in his delicate way, offering her, in this trip, a birthday present to celebrate her coming of age. Then, on the 4th of August, 1900, she yielded to an action that certainly colored her whole life, as well as mine. She had no luck. She was probably offering herself a birthday present that morning. On the 4th of August, 1901, she married me, and set sail for Europe in a great gale of wind, the gale that affected her heart. And no doubt there, again, she was offering herself a birthday gift, the birthday gift of my miserable life. It occurs to me that I have never told you anything about my marriage. That was like this. I have told you, as I think, that I first met Florence at the Stuyvesant's in 14th Street, and from that moment I determined with all the obstinacy of a possibly weak nature, if not to make her mine, at least to marry her. I had no occupation. I had no business affairs. I simply camped down there in Stamford, in a vile hotel, and just passed my days in the house or on the veranda of the Mrs. Hurlbird. The Mrs. Hurlbird, in an odd, obstinate way, did not like my presence. But they were hampered by the national manners of these occasions. Florence had her own sitting-room. She could ask to it whom she liked, and I simply walked into that apartment. I was as timid as you will, but in that manner I was like a chicken that is determined to get across the road in front of an automobile. I would walk into Florence's pretty, little, old-fashioned room, take off my hat, and sit down. Florence had, of course, several other fellows, too, strapping young New Englanders, who worked during the day in New York and spent only the evenings in the village of their birth, and, in the evenings, they would march in on Florence with almost as much determination as myself showed, and I am bound to say that they were received with as much disfavor as was my portion from the Mrs. Hurlbird. They were curious old creatures, those two. It was almost as if they were members of an ancient family under some curse. They were so gentlewomanly, so proper, and they sighed so. Sometimes I would see tears in their eyes. I did not know that my courtship of Florence made much progress at first. Perhaps that was because it took place almost entirely during the daytime, on hot afternoons, when the clouds of dust hung like fog right up as high as the tops of the thin-leaved elms. The night, I believe, is the proper season for the gentle feats of love, not a Connecticut July afternoon, when any sort of proximity is an almost appalling thought. But, if I never so much as kissed Florence, she let me discover very easily, in the course of a fortnight, her simple wants, and I could supply those wants. She wanted to marry a gentleman of leisure, she wanted a European establishment. She wanted her husband to have an English accent, an income of $50,000 a year from real estate, and no ambitions to increase that income. And, she faintly hinted, she did not want much physical passion in the affair. Americans, you know, can envision such unions without blinking. She gave cut this information in floods of bright talk, she would pop a little bit of it into comments over a view of the Rialto, Venice, and whilst she was brightly describing Balmoral Castle, 
She would say that her ideal husband would be one who could get her received at the British court. She had spent, it seemed, two months in Great Britain, seven weeks in touring from Stratford to Strathpeffer, and one as a paying guest in an old English family near Ledbury, an impoverished but still stately family called Bagshaw. They were to have spent two months more in that tranquil bosom, but inopportune events, apparently in her uncle's business, had caused their rather hurried return to Stamford. The young man called Jimmy had remained in Europe to perfect his knowledge of that continent. He certainly did. He was most useful to us afterwards. But the point that came out, that there was no mistaking, was that Florence was coldly and calmly determined to take no look at any man who could not give her a European settlement. Her glimpse of English home life had affected this. She meant, on her marriage, to have a year in Paris, and then to have her husband buy some real estate in the neighborhood of Fordingbridge, from which place the Hurlbirds had come in the year 1688. On the strength of that she was going to take her place in the ranks of English county society. That was fixed. I used to feel mightily elevated when I considered these details, for I could not figure out that amongst her acquaintances in Stamford there was any fellow that would fill the bill. The most of them were not as wealthy as I, and those that were were not the type to give up the fascinations of Wall Street, even for the protracted companionship of Florence. But nothing really happened during the month of July. On the first of August Florence apparently told her aunts that she intended to marry me. She had not told me so, but there was no doubt about the aunts, for on that afternoon Miss Florence Hurlbird, Sr., stopped me on my way to Florence's sitting-room, and took me, agitatedly, into the parlor. It was a singular interview. In that old-fashioned colonial room, with the spindle-legged furniture, the silhouettes, the miniatures, the portrait of General Braddock, and the smell of lavender. You see, the two poor maiden ladies were in agonies, and they could not say one single thing direct. They would almost wring their hands and ask if I had considered such a thing as different temperaments. I assure you they were almost affectionate, concern for me even, as if Florence were too bright for my solid and serious virtues. For they had discovered in me solid and serious virtues. That might have been because I had once dropped the remark that I preferred General Braddock to General Washington, for the Hurlbirds had backed the losing side in the War of Independence, and had been seriously impoverished and quite efficiently oppressed for that reason. The Mrs. Hurlbird could never forget it. Nevertheless, they shuddered at the thought of a European career for myself and Florence. Each of them really wailed when they heard that that was what I hoped to give their niece. That may have been partly because they regarded Europe as a sink of iniquity where strange laxities prevailed. They thought the mother country as Erastrian as any other, and they carried their protest to extraordinary lengths, for them. They even, almost, said that marriage was a sacrament, but neither Miss Florence nor Miss Emily could quite bring herself to utter the word, and they almost brought themselves to say that Florence's early life had been characterized by flirtations, something of that sort. I know I ended the interview by saying, I don't care. If Florence has robbed a bank, I am going to marry her and take her to Europe. And at that, Miss Emily wailed and fainted. But Miss Florence, in spite of the state of her sister, threw herself on my neck and cried out, Don't do it, John. Don't do it. You're a good young man. And she added, whilst I was getting out of the room, to send Florence to her aunt's rescue, We ought to tell you more, but she's our dear sister's child. Florence, I remember, received me with a chalk-pale face and the exclamation, Have those old cats been saying anything against me? But I assured her that they had not, and hurried her into the room of her strangely afflicted relatives. I had really forgotten all about that exclamation of Florence's until this moment. She treated me so very well, with such tact, that, if I ever thought of it afterwards, I put it down to her deep affection for me. And that evening, when I went to fetch her for a buggy ride, she had disappeared. I did not lose any time. I went into New York and engaged berths on the Pocahontas. That was to sail on the evening of the fourth of the month. And then, returning to Stamford, I tracked out, in the course of the day, that Florence had been driven to Rye Station. And there I found that she had taken the cars to Waterbury. She had, of course, gone to her uncle's. 
The old man received me with a stony, husky face. I was not to see Florence. She was ill. She was keeping her room. And, from something that he let drop, an odd biblical phrase that I have forgotten, I gathered that all that family simply did not intend her to marry ever in her life. I procured at once the name of the nearest minister and a rope ladder. You have no idea how primitively these matters were arranged in those days in the United States. I dare say they may be so still. And at one o'clock in the morning on the 4th of August, I was standing in Florence's bedroom. I was so one-minded in my purpose that it never struck me there was anything improper in being at one o'clock in the morning in Florence's bedroom. I just wanted to wake her up. She was not, however, asleep. She expected me, and her relatives had only just left her. She received me with an embrace of a warmth. Well, it was the first time I had ever been embraced by a woman, and it was the last when a woman's embrace has had in it any warmth for me. I suppose it was my own fault, what followed. At any rate, I was in such a hurry to get the wedding over, and was so afraid of her relatives finding me there, that I must have received her advances with a certain amount of absence of mind. I was out of that room and down the ladder in under half a minute. She kept me waiting at the foot an unconscious old time. It was certainly three in the morning before we knocked up that minister, and I think that that wait was the only sign Florence ever showed of having a conscience, as far as I was concerned, unless her lying for some moments in my arms was also a sign of conscience. I fancy that, if I had shown warmth then, she would have acted the proper wife to me, or would have put me back again. But, because I acted like a Philadelphia gentleman, she made me, I suppose, go through with the part of a male nurse. Perhaps she thought that I should not mind. After that, as I gather, she had not any more remorse. She was only anxious to carry out her plans. For just before she came down the ladder, she called me to the top of that grotesque implement, that I went up and down like a tranquil jumping jack. I was perfectly collected. She said to me with a certain fierceness, It is determined that we will sail at four this afternoon. You're not lying about having taken birth. I understood that she would naturally be anxious to get away from the neighborhood of her apparently insane relatives, so that I readily excused her for thinking that I should be capable of lying about such a thing. I made it, therefore, plain to her that it was my fixed determination to sail by the Pocahontas. She said then, it was a moonlit morning, and she was whispering in my ear whilst I stood on the ladder. The hills that surrounded Waterbury showed extraordinarily tranquil around the villa. She said, almost coldly, I wanted to know so as to pack my trunks, and she added, I may be ill, you know. I guess my heart is a little like Uncle Hurlbird's. It runs in families. I whispered that the Pocahontas was an extraordinarily steady boat. Now I wonder what had passed through Florence's mind during the two hours that she had kept me waiting at the foot of the ladder. I would give not a little to know. Till then, I fancy she had had no settled plan in her mind. She certainly never mentioned her heart till that time. Perhaps the renewed sight of her Uncle Hurlbird had given her the idea. Certainly her Aunt Emily, who had come over with her to Waterbury, would have rubbed into her, for hours and hours, the idea that any accentuated discussions would kill the old gentleman. That would recall to her mind all the safeguards against excitement with which the poor silly old gentleman had been hedged in during their trip round the world. That, perhaps, put it into her head. Still, I believe there was some remorse on my account, too. Lenora told me that Florence said there was, for Lenora knew all about it, and once went so far as to ask her how she could do a thing so infamous. She excused herself on the score of an overmastering passion. Well, I always say that an overmastering passion is a good excuse for feelings. You cannot help them, and it is a good excuse for straight actions. She might have bolted with the fellow, before or after she married me. And, if they had not enough money to get along with, they might have cut their throats, or sponged on her family. Though, of course, Florence wanted such a lot, that it would have suited her very badly to have for a husband a clerk in a dry-goods store, 
which is what old Hurlbird would have made of that fellow. He hated him. No, I do not think that there is much excuse for Florence. God knows. She was a frightened fool, and she was fantastic, and I suppose that, at that time, she really cared for that imbecile. He certainly didn't care for her. Poor thing. At any rate, after I had assured her that the Pocahontas was a steady ship, she just said, You'll have to look after me in certain ways, like Uncle Hurlbird is looked after. I will tell you how to do it. And then she stepped over the sill as if she were stepping on board a boat. I suppose she had burnt hers. I had, no doubt, eye-openers enough. When we re-entered the Hurlbird mansion at eight o'clock, the Hurlbirds were just exhausted. Florence had a hard, triumphant air. We had got married about four in the morning, and had sat about in the woods above the town till then, listening to a mockingbird imitate an old tomcat. So I guess Florence had not found getting married to me a very stimulating process. I had not found anything much more inspiring to say than how glad I was, with variations. I think I was too dazed. Well, the Hurlbirds were too dazed to say much. We had breakfast together, and then Florence went to pack her grips and things. Old Hurlbird took the opportunity to read me a full-blooded lecture in the style of an American oration as to the perils for young American girlhood lurking in the European jungle. He said that Paris was full of snakes in the grass, of which he had had bitter experience. He concluded, as they always do, poor, dear old things, with the aspiration that all American women should one day be sexless though that is not the way they put it. Well, we made the ship all right by one thirty, and there was a tempest blowing. That helped Florence a good deal, for we were not ten minutes out from Sandy Hook before Florence went down into her cabin and her heart took her. An agitated stewardess came running up to me, and I went running down. I got my directions how to behave to my wife. Most of them came from her, though it was the ship doctor who discreetly suggested to me that I had better refrain from manifestations of affection. I was ready enough. I was, of course, full of remorse. It occurred to me that her heart was the reason for the Hurlbird's mysterious desire to keep their youngest and dearest unmarried. Of course, they would be too refined to put the motive into words. They were old stock New Englanders. They would not want to have to suggest that a husband must not kiss the back of his wife's neck. They would not like to suggest that he might, for the matter of that. I wonder, though, how Florence got the doctor to enter the conspiracy. The several doctors. Of course her heart squeaked a bit. She had the same configuration of the lungs as her Uncle Hurlbird, and, in his company, she must have heard a great deal of heart talk from specialists. Anyhow, she and they tied me pretty well down, and Jimmy, of course, that dreary boy. What in the world did she see in him? He was lugubrious, silent, morose. He had no talent as a painter. He was very sallow and dark, and he never shaved sufficiently. He met us at Harve, and he proceeded to make himself useful for the next two years, during which he lived in our flat in Paris, whether we were there or not. He studied painting at Julian's, or some such place. That fellow had his hands always in the pocket of his odious, square-shouldered, broad-hipped, American coats, and his dark eyes were always full of ominous appearances. He was, besides, too fat. Why, I was much the better man. And I dare say Florence would have given me the better. She showed signs of it. I think, perhaps... The enigmatic smile with which she used to look back at me over her shoulder when she went into the bathing place was a sort of invitation. I have mentioned that. It was as if she were saying, I am going in here, I am going to stand so stripped and white and straight, and you are a man. Perhaps it was that. No, she could not have liked that fellow long. He looked like sallow putty. I understand that he had been slim and dark and very graceful at the time of her first disgrace, but loafing about in Paris, on her pocket money, and on the allowance that old Hurlbird made him to keep out of the United States, had given him a stomach like a man of forty, 
and dyspeptic irritation on top of it. God, how they worked me! It was those two between them who really elaborated the rules. I have told you something about them, how I had to head conversations for all those eleven years off such topics as love, poverty, crime, and so on. But looking over what I have written, I see that I have unintentionally misled you when I said that Florence was never out of my sight. Yet that was the impression that I really had until just now. When I come to think of it, she was out of my sight most of the time. You see, that fellow impressed upon me that what Florence needed most of all were sleep and privacy. I must never enter her room without knocking, or her poor little heart might flutter away to its doom. He said these things with his lugubrious croak, and his black eyes like a crow's, so that I seemed to see poor Florence die ten times a day, a little pale, frail corpse. Why, I would as soon have thought of entering her room without her permission as of burglaring a church. I would sooner have committed that crime. I would certainly have done it if I had thought the state of her heart demanded the sacrilege. So at ten o'clock at night the door closed upon Florence, who had gently, and, as if reluctantly, backed up that fellow's recommendations, and she would wish me good night as if she were a cinquento Italian lady, saying good-bye to her lover, and at ten o'clock of the next morning there she would come out of the door of her room, as fresh as Venus rising from any of the couches that are mentioned in Greek legends. Her room door was locked because she was nervous about thieves, but an electric contrivance on a cord was understood to be attached to her little wrist. She had only to press a bulb to raise the house. And I was provided with an axe, an axe, great gods, with which to break down her door in case she ever failed to answer my knock, after I knocked really loud several times. It was pretty well thought out, you see. What wasn't so well thought out were the ultimate consequences, our being tied to Europe. For that young man rubbed it so well into me that Florence would die if she crossed the channel. He impressed it so fully on my mind that, when later Florence wanted to go to Fordingbridge, I cut the proposal short, absolutely short, with a curt no. It fixed her and it frightened her. I was even backed up by all the doctors. I seemed to have had endless interviews with doctor after doctor, cool, quiet men who would ask, in reasonable tones, whether there was any reason for our going to England, any special reason. And since I could not see any special reason, they would give the verdict, better not then, I dare say they were honest enough as things go. They probably imagined that the mere associations of the steamer might have effects on Florence's nerves. That would be enough, that and the conscientious desire to keep our money on the continent. It must have rattled poor Florence pretty considerably. For you see, the main idea, the only main idea of her heart, that was otherwise cold, was to get to Fordingbridge and be a county lady in the home of her ancestors. But Jimmy got her there. He shut on her the door of the channel. Even on the fairest day of blue sky, with the cliffs of England shining like mother of pearl and full view of Calais, I would not have let her cross the steamer gangway to save her life. I tell you, it fixed her. It fixed her beautifully, because she could not announce herself as cured, since that would have put an end to the locked bedroom arrangements. And, by the time she was sick of Jimmy which happened in the year 1903, she had taken on Edward Ashburnham. Yes, it was a bad fix for her, because Edward could have taken her to Fordingbridge, and though he could not give her Bradshaw Manor, that home of her ancestors, being settled on his wife, she could at least have pretty considerably queened it there, or thereabouts, what with our money and the support of the Ashburnhams. Her uncle, as soon as he considered that she had really settled down with me, and I sent him only the most glowing accounts of her virtue and constancy, made over to her a very considerable part of his fortune, for which he had no use. I suppose that we had, between us, fifteen thousand a year in English money, though I never quite knew how much of hers went to Jimmy. At any rate, we could have shown in Fordingbridge. I never quite knew, either, how she and Edward got rid of Jimmy. I fancy that fat and disreputable raven must have had his six golden front teeth knocked down his throat by Edward one morning, whilst I had gone out to buy some flowers in the Rue de la Paix. Leaving Florence in the flat in charge of those two, 
and serve him very right is all that i can say he was a bad sort of blackmailer i hope florence does not have his company in the next world as god is my judge i do not believe that i would have separated those two if i had known that they really and passionately loved each other i do not know where the public morality of the case comes in and of course no man really knows what he would have done in any given case but i truly believe that i would have united them observing ways and means as decent as i could i believe that i should have given them money to live upon and that i should have consoled myself somehow at that date i might have found some young thing like massy maiden or the poor girl and i might have had some peace for peace i never had with florence and hardly believed that i cared for her in the way of love after a year or two of it she became for me a rare and fragile object something burdensome but very frail why it was as if i had been given a thin-shelled pullet's egg to carry on my palm from equatorial africa to hoboken yes she became for me as it were the subject of a bet the trophy of an athlete's achievement a parsley crown that is the symbol of his chastity his soberness his abstentions and of his inflexible will of intrinsic value as a wife i think she had none at all for me i fancy i was not even proud of the way she dressed but her passion for jimmy was not even a passion and mad as the suggestion may appear she was frightened for her life yes she was afraid of me i will tell you how that happened i had in the old days a darky servant called julius who valeted me and waited on me and loved me like the crown of his head now when we left waterbury to go to the pocahontas florence entrusted to me one very special and very precious leather grip she told me that her life might depend on that grip which contained her drugs against heart attacks and since i was never much of a hand at carrying things i entrusted this in turn to julius who was a gray-haired chap of sixty or so and very picturesque at that he made so much impression on florence that she regarded him as a sort of father and absolutely refused to let me take him to paris he would have inconvenienced her well julius was so overcome with grief at being left behind that he must needs go and drop the precious grip i saw red i saw purple i flew at julius on the ferry it was i filled up one of his eyes i threatened to strangle him and since an unresisting negro can make a deplorable noise and a deplorable spectacle and since that was florence's first adventure in the married state she got a pretty idea of my character it affirmed in her the desperate resolve to conceal from me the fact that she was not what she would have called a pure woman for that was really the mainspring of her fantastic actions she was afraid that i should murder her so she got up the heart attack at the earliest possible opportunity on board the liner perhaps she was not so very much to be blamed you must remember that she was a new englander and that new england had not yet come to loathe darkies as it does now whereas if she had come from even so little south as philadelphia and had been an oldish family she would have seen that for me to kick julius was not so outrageous an act as for her cousin reggie hurlbird to say as i have heard him say to his english butler that for two cents he would bat him on the pants besides the medicine grip did not bulk as largely in her eyes as it did in mine where it was the symbol of the existence of an adored wife of a day to her it was just a useful eye well there you have the position as clear as i can make it the husband an ignorant fool the wife a cold sensualist with imbecile fears for i was such a fool that i should never have known that she was or was not and the blackmailing lover and then the other lover came along well edward ashburnham was worth having have i conveyed to you the splendid fellow that he was the fine soldier the excellent landlord the extraordinarily kind careful and industrious magistrate the upright honest fair-dealing fair-thinking public character i suppose i have not conveyed it to you the truth is that i never knew it until the poor girl came along the poor girl who was just as straight as splendid and as upright as he i swear she was i suppose i ought to have known i suppose that was really why i liked him so much so infinitely much come to think of it 
I can remember a thousand little acts of kindliness, of thoughtfulness for his inferiors, even on the continent. Look here, I know of two families of dirty, unpicturesque, Hessian paupers, that that fellow, with an infinite patience, rooted up, got their police reports, set on their feet, or exported to my patient land. And he would do it quite inarticulately, set in motion by seeing a child crying in the street. He would wrestle with dictionaries, in that unfamiliar tongue. Well, he could not bear to see a child cry. Perhaps he could not bear to see a woman and not give her the comfort of his physical attractions. But, although I liked him so intensely, I was rather apt to take these things for granted. They made me feel comfortable with him, good towards him. They made me trust him. But I guess I thought it was part of the character of any English gentleman. Why, one day he got it into his head that the head waiter at the Excelsior had been crying, that fellow with the gray face and gray whiskers. And then he spent the best part of a week in correspondence and up at the British consuls in getting the fellow's wife to come back from London and bring back his girl baby. She had bolted with a Swiss scullion. If she had not come inside the week, he would have gone to London himself to fetch her. He was like that. Edward Ashburnham was like that, and I thought it was only the duty of his rank and station. Perhaps that was all that it was, but I pray God to make me discharge mine as well. And, but for the poor girl, I dare say that I should never have seen it, however much the feeling might have been over me. She had for him such enthusiasm that, although even now I do not understand the technicalities of English life, I can gather enough. She was with them during the whole of our last day at Nauheim. Nancy Rufford was her name. She was Leonora's only friend's only child, and Leonora was her guardian, if that is the correct term. She had lived with the Ashburnhams ever since she had been of the age of thirteen, when her mother was said to have committed suicide owing to the brutalities of her father. Yes, it is a cheerful story. Edward always called her the girl, and it was very pretty, the evident affection he had for her and she for him and Leonora's feet she would have kissed. Those two were, for her, the best man and the best woman on earth, and in heaven. I think that she had not a thought of evil in her head, the poor girl. Well, anyhow, she chanted Edward's praises to me for the hour together. But, as I have said, I could not make much of it. It appeared that he had the DSO, and that his troop loved him beyond the love of men. You never saw such a troop as his, and he had the Royal Humane Society's medal with a clasp. That meant, apparently, that he had twice jumped off the deck of a troop ship to rescue what the girl called Tommies, who had fallen overboard in the Red Sea and such places. He had been twice recommended for the V.C., whatever that might mean, and, although owing to some technicalities, he had never received that apparently coveted order. He had some special place about his sovereign, at the coronation, or perhaps it was some post in the beefeaters. She made him out like a cross between Longren and the Cheval Bayard. Perhaps he was, but he was too silent a fellow to make that sight of him really decorative. I remember going to him at about that time and asking him what the DSO was, and he grunted out. It's a sort of thing they give grocers who've honorably supplied the troops with adulterated coffee in wartime something of that sort. He did not quite carry conviction to me, so, in the end, I put it directly to Lenora. I asked her fully and squarely, prefacing the question with some remarks, such as those I have already given you, as to the difficulty one has in really getting to know people when one's intimacy is conducted as an English acquaintanceship. I asked her whether her husband was not really a splendid fellow, along at least the lines of his public functions. She looked at me with a slightly awakened air, with an air that would have been almost startled if Leonora could ever have been startled. "'Didn't you know?' she asked. "'If I come to think of it, there is not a more splendid fellow in any three counties. Pick them where you will, along those lines.' And she added, after she had looked at me reflectively for what seemed a long time, "'To do my husband justice, there could not be a better man on the earth. There would not be room for it.' along those lines. Well, I said, then he must really be a Longren and the Cid in one body. 
for there are not any other lines that count. Again, she looked at me for a long time. It's your opinion that there are no other lines that count? she asked slowly. Well, I answered gaily, you're not going to accuse him of not being a good husband, or of not being a good guardian to your ward. She spoke then, slowly, like a person who was listening to the sounds in a seashell held to her ear, and, would you believe it, she told me afterwards that, at that speech of mine, for the first time, she had a vague inkling of the tragedy that was to follow so soon, although the girl had lived with them for eight years or so. Oh, I'm not thinking of saying that he is not the best of husbands, or that he is not very fond of the girl. And then I said something like, Well, Leonora, a man sees more of these things than even a wife. And let me tell you, that in all the years I've known Edward, he has never, in your absence, paid a moment's attention to any other woman, not by the quivering of an eyelash. I should have noticed. And he talks of you as if you were one of the angels of God. Oh, she came up to the scratch, as you could be sure Leonora would always come up to the scratch. I am perfectly sure that he always speaks nicely of me. I dare say she had practice in that sort of scene. People must have been always complimenting her on her husband's fidelity and adoration. For half the world, the whole of the world that knew Edward and Leonora, believed that his conviction in the Kilsite affair had been a miscarriage of justice, a conspiracy of false evidence got together by nonconformist adversaries. But think of the fool that I was. End of Part 2, Section 1